realism is something taken for granted in the RAF. And there is realism in every line of these vintage planes, Newports and Camels, Chrisleys and Chipmunks, assembled near the runways at Cunningsby, Lincolnshire, for the RAF Model Aircraft Championships. What can be learnt from such models in a supersonic age? A thousand RAF model builders could give you the answer to that. Eliminating contests have been held in seven out of nine home commands. Now the results in the balance. For the Concorde d'Elegance, beauty of workmanship wins high points, but beauty itself is not enough. Each plane must fly 20 seconds to qualify. Here's a pussmoth too interested in eggs. Not all the crashes are as bad as they appear. Engines and airframes can be made airworthy again in a matter of minutes. But not this time. model this seagull, built by a sergeant of Bomber Command, but in less than 20 seconds, three months' work for none. Technical interest at the meeting is centred on radio control, with rudders answering to signals relayed by midget receivers less than eight ounces in weight. On a wavelength of 27 megacycles, he can control his model up to a distance of a mile. So in miniature, we see the pattern of the future as she flies radio control through the sky. This young patient at Heather Green Hospital, London, is shortly going to take a trip two and a half miles up, but his feet will never leave the ground. Tony here is suffering from the after effects of whooping cough, and he's about to become the subject of a new experimental shortcut cure. The doctor checks his heart and ears before Tony receives the decompression treatment, a long spell under atmospheric conditions which prevail at 14,000 feet up in the sky. And this is the decompression chamber, the only one put to this use in Britain. Formerly used to acclimatise pilots in training, it's now the testing ground for new health experiment. Here, Nurse Patricia Crabb shepherds Tony, Brenda and baby Marilyn inside. The nurse's fountain pen might leak under the pressure, so she hands it over before the chamber is sealed up. Now the occupants are climbing at the rate of 600 feet a minute. At the equivalent of 14,000 feet, the lowest pressure is maintained for 45 minutes. Throughout the test, contact is maintained with the ground. The descent from the upper regions takes place gradually, 24 minutes to reach normal atmospheric pressure. For the patients, it's just an exciting interlude in playtime. But doctors throughout Britain await eagerly the results of the strange ascent. It may well be final defeat for a dreaded ailment. The scene is Burnham on Crouch, Essex where naturalists working for the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries have a research station into shellfish problems. At one time, 100 million oysters were eaten annually in Britain. That may take some swallowing, but it's a fact. And so are a few other things they've found out. At one time, the native oyster provided a basis for a flourishing industry, its care and cultivation providing employment for a large number of people. During the present century, there's been a marked decline due chiefly to neglect of the beds during war years and the introduction of pests from abroad. Here's an effective way of dealing with one such pest, slipper limpets which breed more rapidly than oysters and compete with them for food and settling space. They're dredged and fed into a modified cake crusher.
then the remains are carted to the side and heaved overboard to settle on the bed where they act as a fertilizer. The oyster cultivator's job is no easy one. It's a long-term one too, for oysters which settled this year will not be ready for market until next year and during that time have to be protected not only from pests but from bad weather conditions. Great care is taken with the newly settled baby oysters or spat as they're called. After the parent frees them they swim about for 10 days then settle on any suitable surface. Great progress has been made in restocking and reclaiming once derelict oyster grounds which will one day it is hoped be restored to their original glory. Every dog, like every man, is supposed to have his day, but often it's the off day and a call at the clinic. Bruce is a mongrel terrier undergoing the latest in treatments for canine complaints such as rickets and distemper. At a Camberwell London clinic, he is given a three weeks course of ultraviolet ray treatment, starting with two minute sessions and increasing to 10 minutes. Bruce and Rex, an Irish setter recovering from distemper paralysis, prove the truth of the old saying that it's only in sickness you find out who your real friends are. In Rex's case, the clinic hopes the treatment will almost completely restore the power of his legs. Lucky dog. And though sun ray makes your coat grow thick, this isn't a shaggy dog story. This is Barton Broad, Norfolk, one of the glistening waterways which, linked by rivers, provide 200 miles of inland yachting amid matchless scenery. But the very beauty of the broads, its lily beds and whispering reeds, is today a danger menacing the sport of thousands. For slowly, the banks are closing in. More and more frequent becomes this set piece of a craft stranded in the grip of weeds. A long-term policy of reclamation alone can save the broads from eventual extinction and preserve one of the great beauty spots of Britain. Yet only one small weed cutter craft is there, fighting a losing battle against the encircling reeds. Today's year-round fight is only a continuation of the war between weeds and water begun 2,000 years ago. Then the Broads district was an arm of the sea. Ever since the vast mirrors were cut off, the encroachment has gone on. Now only 1% of the original waters remain. The cutter can clear 2,000 square yards of weed a day, yet to restore the broads in depth and service area calls for a million pound project. Pushing back the enemy, the cutter's blades tear through stems six feet below the surface. Its operator is waterman Nat Bircham, working for one of the many boat builders who supply the needs of visiting holidaymakers. But without a fleet of cutters to help him, Nats is a battle against overwhelming odds. Centuries ago, this present-day paradise of naturalists and playground of sportsmen watched the Vikings come. Today, new invaders threaten on the lonely broads. 